Uh, now let's talk about education in New York, where Mayor Bill de Blasio is praising a plan uh, to confront segregated schools where students are screened uh, when it comes to the classrooms. That's a huge problem, uh, and uh, because for many black folks and Latinos, they're being frozen out of some of the city's most elite schools. Here's my conversation with Mayor Bill de Blasio. Mayor de Blasio, glad to have you here on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Uh, first off, um, this, this whole issue of um, integrating the schools in New York, for a lot of people, of course, they think that New York City is extremely liberal and progressive, but when you look at education, for years, it has been a segregated school, what, separated by the haves and the have-nots, in many cases, based upon race. Roland, look, um, we've got hundreds of years of American history that are playing out in this city and cities all over the country. There's no question about it. Uh, it's first and foremost about race and economics and uh, the kinds of jobs people had, the kind of incomes they had, the kind of housing they had, where they were allowed to live and where they weren't allowed to live. And uh, it's left us with a city uh, where, yeah, our schools uh, you know, end up reflecting that, and we've got a lot of work to do to address it. Now, I, I've said from the beginning we can't address all those realities through the schools alone, and I think that's a really important point of honesty that we can do a certain amount through our schools to create more diverse uh, classrooms. A lot of what we have to do beyond that is about raising wages, raising benefits, creating a lot more equality in our society across the board. But what we are doing here, and I'm really proud of what the parents of this city are increasingly doing. They're stepping forward with real specific ideas about how to diversify district by district. We've got 32 school districts in New York City, 1.1 million kids in our public schools. And now we've had three of our school districts come forward and create their own grassroots plans with the help of our Department of Education that are going to create a real step forward for diversification and now are becoming a model that we can take citywide. Uh, and, Mayor, it's interesting because I'm looking at a New York Times story uh, on September 20th where uh, the headline was de Blasio acts on school integration but others lead charge. And it says the plan was created not by City Hall or even the Department of Education but by parents in District 15, which includes the Brooklyn neighborhoods of Park Slope, Sunset Park, and Red Hook. And so in many ways, again, for me as a supporter of school choice or parental choice, whatever you want to call it, I mean, these are parents who are saying we want to be active in the education of our children. And so I get their point, but I don't have a problem having parents telling City Hall and telling the Department of Education we want changes to how, how our kids are being educated. Well, Roland, I think uh, the reality here is we are looking for change that will last, that will be deep-seated, uh, that will um, succeed on an ongoing basis. And I think in this instance, you, you know the history of efforts at desegregation around the country when it comes to education. It's a, it's a checkered history, to say the least, and uh, often has left out the question of the quality of the schools for kids of all backgrounds. We believe we have a, a broad mandate to fix our schools, to make schools high quality across all neighborhoods, all zip codes. But meanwhile, I think there's a really a positive way to diversify our classrooms, but it has to be with parental buy-in and a real grassroots involvement to avoid the pitfalls and the conflicts of the past. And that's what we're seeing here. So in this case, look, the Department of Education is a part of the process every step of the way, or it wouldn't ultimately work. I mean, we're playing a very active role, but it is true that we're welcoming grassroots leadership and we're welcoming tough community conversations for people to recognize how important the change is. And yeah, it will come with uh, changes that will affect their, their lives, their families in some ways that some parents may be hesitant about, but it's gonna get us to a, a greater goal of more diverse schools, more diversified schools that are better for everyone. And what we've found is if you give parents that seat at the table, they're really buying into it and they're helping to lead the charge. That's the difference from the top-down attempts at desegregation that often failed because they ran into a lot of community opposition and didn't address the core question of making sure all schools improve simultaneously. And what jumps out at me, so, so exactly, so 
for folks who don't know about New York City, uh, what is the current uh, process? I mean, how does it work? Uh, are, every, are all schools screening? Uh, and does this apply to just so-called specialty schools, magnet programs? Uh, so explain it for the folks who are unfamiliar with how New York City operates. Okay, so this latest uh, step forward is District 15, and I'll explain to answer your question in the process. This is the part of Brooklyn you refer to, often called Brownstone, Brooklyn. It's the area of Brooklyn that I come from and my kids went to public school in. It also includes some neighborhoods, including Sunset Park and Red Hook, that have been historically disadvantaged. So it's an interesting mix of different types of neighborhoods. This is about uh, moving away from screening uh, for our middle schools. So whereas, for example, elementary schools, generally are done, you know, the selection process, the, the application process is around geography and a zone you live in. Uh, and even that has been something we're trying to address uh, and diversify by changing some of the zone borders in some parts of the city. But historically, um, elementary school is about where you live and what school zone you're in. But choice starts to be applied at middle school and then, of course, high school. So the choice programs include a lot of schools that were called, quote, unquote, screen schools. And those were schools that were often considered to have higher standards and be very appealing uh, for parents to get their kids into. So, so, the, so the I, I got to ask you, those, Go screen, those screen schools. So, again, I, I went to a magnet school in Houston. Uh, and so I, had, so I had to apply to get into the magnet school although another part of the school, Jack Hayes High School, students who were zoned there went there. So for these, these schools here, now granted, that was a magnet program. So we talk about these screen schools, are these specialized schools or are they just traditional public schools, but because of their, the rigor or because of, uh, of you know, how other students have turned out, that you have to uh, essentially uh, be screened to get in? So just a, a great question. I'd say, you know, these are not uh, the kinds of middle schools and high schools that we still have plenty of that are based on a geographical area. They are uh, schools that kids apply to from a wider geography that have a specialty typically, uh, that have certain standards that historically they've held in terms of, you know, whether it's grade point average or having a portfolio of work that you've done or, or other standards that defined how kids got in versus, for example, uh, a school that is something you're geographically zoned for where all kids got in equally. So what's happened here in this district in Brooklyn is that the parents said, we want to actually get rid of those screens. We want to get rid of those filters and just say, kids are welcome at any of the schools in our district, any middle school. And then we're going to ensure fairness by having a system of ensuring that each school basically reflects the demography of the district. So, for example, if uh, lower income kids make up about half of uh, the student population of our elementary schools in that district, then each middle school should reflect that pretty much. And that's going to be a factor in how we create balance and get representation from all types of neighborhoods. And kids would be welcomed in regardless of their academic achievement levels. And it would put the responsibility on the school community, starting with the principal and the teachers, to help kids of all backgrounds, you know, all working together in the same school, lift all boats. That's the underlying idea, that the screening, although I think the screening was uh, done in many cases with no ignoble intent, uh, what happened over mm -hmm. time was it did create that kind of skew. And it did create a situation where a lot of the classrooms were not diverse enough. And what the parents are saying, and, and Roland, a lot of educators are coming forward saying they believe in this, even if it might mean honestly more work for them, is mm -hmm. they want a more diverse student body. They're ready to take on the challenges of some young people who haven't had as much uh, educational opportunity, and they believe they can help all kids simultaneously. Just a couple more questions here. And first of all, according to this New York Times story, this is going to impact 11 of the city's roughly 600 middle schools. Is that correct, or is it going to be more, more schools impacted? Well, for it's, this district is the one, and I, I don't know if 11 is the exact number, but it is one of our 32 districts and just the middle schools. But what really matters here, as I mentioned, two other districts have done uh, a variation on this approach with their elementary schools. So we now have uh, three districts that have either elementary school or middle school or both where they're creating diversification efforts with a lot of parent buy-in and that have real grassroots support. So this is now a model that we'd like to see go farther. We're providing grant money, as is the state of New York. We've got 10 districts now 
uh, that are ready to act on creating their own plan, uh, again, starting with grassroots involvement. And uh, we think this is just going to keep spreading, and we're going to encourage it. I'm going to help it every step along the way that I can as mayor. But, but what I think is so powerful here is this is a honest grassroots momentum fueling this where more and more parents are saying, you know, this is just the right thing to do. And, and every time they see another district do it effectively and without a lot of rancor, I mean, there's always going to be some angst and there's always going to be parents worried that in some way it might affect their kid uh, that they don't want to see. But mainly what we've heard is voices saying we can do better and let's find a way to do this together. Um, just, uh, so you, of course, have been trying to take over the schools uh, and, and wanting to be more involved in education. Uh, and also, well, we have mayor, I'm just going to interrupt. We have mayoral control gotcha. of education here. It has to be renewed in our state gotcha. legislature, but that is the reality right now. Uh, and one of the things that, and so the legislature has not renewed that, correct? They have to next year, so Got we it. have it until next year, but then there has to, we have to go through the process again. So one of the things that, that jumps out at me, again, is that, and, and I've been following this, of course, uh, because, like I said earlier, uh, I certainly uh, support uh, school choice. There's no form of school I don't support as long as it works. So for me, that's traditional public, charter, magnet, homeschool, online school, technical school. I don't care. Uh, and so there's been this constant back and forth in, in New York uh, with charter schools and, and whatnot. Uh, do you believe that charters can play a role if, and again, my, from my position, they must be successful? Just like I believe traditional schools must be successful. Why do we have to have the either or? Why can't we operate, operate with and? Well, Roland, I agree with the concept that um, there's room at the table for all schools that work. I think what's happened here is that the debate got skewed, and I really feel like this was true before I came into office, that there was a bias in our Department of Education in favor of charter schools that in some ways was not about the quality, but was a philosophical favoring of uh, charter schools over traditional public schools, and I think that was a mistake. Um, the fact is that the charter school community is very diverse. There are some schools that are absolutely outstanding. There are some schools that are extraordinary at teaching kids in a, in a very modern, progressive way, critical decision-making and critical thinking and problem-solving and the things that really typify what we need in education today. And bluntly, there's some other schools in the charter world that are incessant test prep factories and that earned their reputation with great test scores but taught kids exactly the way that's been rejected by most educators. So there's a lot of range there. I want to see the schools that are doing things the right way and succeeding uh, get our support. And we, by the way, I, my number one signature initiative in general was pre-K for all. We did that with charter schools. They were welcome to the table. Religious schools were welcome to the table. Community organizations, that's part of why it worked. So, no, I, I think we can break down that kind of artificial debate, artificial barrier uh, that used to exist, but with a clear philosophical and quality uh, consideration that it's not all charters are good or all charters are bad, but with charters, we need to see them take all kids like our traditional public schools do, including special ed kids, English language learners, kids who don't test as well, treat them with equal respect, equal support, and not make the curriculum all about test prep.